So, living with others in the presence of our strange God, that's my high point. Um, how we encounter the world <clears throat> depends to a great extent on how we remember who and what we are. The Czech novelist uh, Milan Kundera, in his novel The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, he states, the struggle of men and women against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. Memory against forgetting. And what I'm trying to do in this little talk is to remember certain things about our tradition. As disciples, what we are called to remember for the what is it that we're called to, to remember for the sake of our world? In our weekly Eucharists, we remember the doings of God with his freed people, Israel. We remember God in Christ. We remember the doings of God in Christ with our world. At the heart of this weekly remembering, memory, is strangeness. The God who called Moses to be the leader of this strange hodgepodge of migrant workers, emigres, war survivors, revealed himself strangely in a burning bush. That's that first little, rather nice uh, painting by Chagall of Moses before the burning bush. Yeah? Um, and as the prophet, as Moses comes nearer to the burning bush, this voice tells him he's going to go to Pharaoh and free God's people. And Moses says, well, <laughs> how are we going to do that? How am I going to go before the equivalent of Mr. Trump, <laughs> as it were? Uh, the most powerful person on the planet at the time, and say, I'm just going to take the Hebrew slaves away, you know, from your building projects. So he says, who, who am I going to tell him sent me? And of course the name comes, Yahweh. Very strange name. Very, very. We normally translate it, as you know, I am who I am. But because it's Hebrew, it can be interpreted in a number of different ways. It can be I will be where I will be, and I will be who I will be. In other words, you've got no idea who I am, you know? And you'll never be able to define me, you'll never be able to limit me, you'll never be able to image me in a realistic way. Strange indeed. The mystics of Judaism and Christianity, and indeed of Sufi Islam, have explored that strangeness of the divine ever since at times to the edge of madness. Now, the theme of strangeness emerges time and again. It is the strange figure of Melchizedek, that's the priestly guy up there in the middle, of Melchizedek, who, as you know uh, from the book of Genesis, um, greets Sarah and Abram on their travels, blesses bread and wine, uh, and so shares with them. He's a foreigner. He's a, he's a representative of a strange religion. In fact, we don't know what the religion was. We have no idea. He offers bread and wine to them on their journey. Three strangers, the messengers who meet Abraham and Sarah at the Oak of Mamre, that's the lovely Rublev icon, in the Russian Orthodox Church, they're interpreted as angels because, as you know, the Greek word for messenger is angelos. Um, they seem, they promise the seeming impossible to Abraham and Sarah, the aged couple, a birth of a son and the creation of a new people. And this strange new people, as evidence of their authentic, strange, divine origin, must create, create forevermore a nation where the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, the powerless ones, and notice the stranger there, a privileged place in the midst of this strange God's strange rule. And so Israel itself is called to be a living reminder that God's people were once casualties of war and pawns in the free play of 
political struggle. And forevermore, they must create a space for just such oppressed sons and daughters of Eve. And then much later, our strange God comes closer still as the child of this liberated people who are yet again under the Roman occupation, slaves effectively. But who recognizes the divine presence? Not the children within the covenant, apart from the shepherds and they were marginal people, but three strangers from the east of people of color, of strange languages, and stranger religions still. Revelation of the divine presence within comes with the help of the stranger from outside. Stranger always has the possibility of opening up our world if they're given the space to be themselves in our midst. As we heard last night from Al, it's, it's a stranger from without, the Syrophoenician woman from a different country speaking a different dialect of Syriac, who provokes Jesus to open his message of the kingdom beyond the borders of a reformed Israel, which is his, his initial focus is to, if he can only get his people to turn back to what they should be, they will be assigned to the nation. So he focuses on them. But then he comes across this extraordinary woman who won't go away. You know, and the disciples were all embarrassed, you know, and he, he's quite rude to her, really. He says, I've come for the children of Israel. It's not appropriate that the food for the children should be given to the puppies. And, I mean, you could say that's a racist comment, you know, uh, the puppies. Uh, and she immediately says, ah, yes, but even the puppies can pick up the crumbs. And I think he laughed then. You know, I think he saw, uh, you know, her strength and her faith. And so he, he tells her her daughter will be fine because he sees the faith and he knows God will work through it. But from that point onwards, his eyes are open to a wider kingdom. And in John's Gospel, he will go through Samaria, which he has never up to that point done. No good Jew would because they were the, the hated national enemy and, and so on and so forth. And then it, it's a Samaritan woman at the well, the story we all know. These are all little vignettes I've put up there of uh, different types of art. It's a, a, a Samaritan woman at the well, again, an enemy of the chosen people for all sorts of reasons I haven't got time to look at at the moment. But no self by you know, really good, righteous Jew would talk to a Samaritan. And he asks her for what she can give him, water, and within minutes they're into the water of life, they're into the real nature of religion, and and of course, this, this lady has a history, uh, which eventually is revealed, five men in her life, and da da da. I always think it's great, he doesn't say go back to number one. You know? <laughs> Just go away and sin no more. Yeah, but anyway, um, and she goes to her village, where she is a marginal person because of her life, and brings them to the Lord. She's the first apostle. Extraordinary. And they come to believe in the gospel, a gospel that is not limited by Jerusalem or their holy mountain, Geritzim, which was a mosaic uh, shrine. Indeed, not limited by any holy place, churches or basilicas or whatever. And the gospel will, from then on, happen as Jesus prophesies, wherever men and women gather in spirit and in truth. The risen Jesus himself is a stranger to his disciples and companions. They do not immediately recognize him. He comes among them opening up perspectives that no one had anticipated. No one was expecting one person to rise from the dead. They thought, some of them, thought that at the end of time the, the righteous might rise and be taken into paradise. This idea of someone in anticipation of the end being taken up into God, it was complete mind-blowing event, which they, they weren't ready for. And the, the, the strangeness of him can only be entered when he, the stranger, has been accepted and welcomed like the two on the way to a mess, when they sit down at a table 
They welcomed him in for food, and then he is revealed. We're called to remember, in the midst of our people, that the strange God, this strange God, continues throughout the history of salvation to provoke us to see and to think differently. Differently. The means to this provocation, to thought and renewed understanding, is often the stranger. Migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers, provoke us to see what it is we have and so many desire. A free land where life and love and worship can be pursued by liberated men and women. But they bring us riches of culture and new perspectives that challenge us and provide work without which our freedom cannot continue. This is just trite, but I'm, what I'm saying here, but what would the National Health Service be without Irish and Afro-Caribbean men and women for the last 50 years? How tedious our cuisine, <laughs> I come from Birmingham, you see. Uh, you know, I grew up with, you know, potato, uh, meat and two veg. Yeah. Uh, but I remember the first time my mum put a curry down on the table. Whoa, what an experience that was. It, you know, um, and then now, Italian, Greek, Indian, Thai, sushi, Moroccan, Spanish restaurants are everywhere around the city. And, you know, we have curry with our chips. <laughs> How dull would um, my life in Birmingham be without the balti restaurants at the heart of the city in the balti prime? Our changed tastes are a simple sign of such strange diversity, celebrated and appreciated. In every age, it's the renewal of prophetic imagination that opens us up afresh to the strangeness of our God and the expectation of discovering the divine in the unexpected other. Such prophetic imagination, then, is not issue-led. You know, it's not based on principles of Catholic social teaching, however wonderful they may be. It's not just by focusing on particular issue. It rather focuses from, on the dominant crisis in every age. It's the dominant crisis that provokes the prophetic imagination to emerge throughout the history of Israel and throughout the history of Christianity. And this requires an alternative consciousness capable of critique and even dismantling of the dominant consciousness. At the same time, it requires an alternative consciousness capable of energizing individuals and communities by its promise of an alternative vision and reality to which we can work towards what Jesus called the kingdom of God. aware that the seeming fixed nature of things at this moment in time, here and now, for example, our economic system, which is global now, even China's bought into it in a modified way, a form of Maoist state. Yeah. Aware that the seeming fixed nature of our economic system or our religious structures are not in fact fixed but contingent and dependent on all sorts of scaffolding and structures which are in no sense absolutely secure and in no sense absolutely necessary. When the Lord died and rose, he left us with a meal, the example of his life, and some wonderful stories and teachings. And then Pentecost happened, and the rest we built for good and ill. But we need to remember, rem in remembering Jesus, remembering Jesus is a dangerous memory because potentially it frees us from so many things that are not necessary to the kingdom. And if we just think of economics, the recent bank crisis, it's a serious crisis. It goes to the heart of our financial and political structures across the globe. And the crisis hasn't gone away. All that's happened is our states have bailed us out for the time being. And we all know it can come back. What it needs is the prophetic imagination to think 
or how this could be different. And there are people doing that now, thank God. And Pope Francis has really plugged this so much in his, I mean, he, some of the right-wing Americans call him a Marxist, you know. You know what is less a Marxist than that poor man. But, but he's got brilliant young Jesuit theologian, economists working in Georgetown and elsewhere, totally committed for the rest of their, probably their lives, to trying to come up with a realistic alternative economic order that could work for us. The prophetic imagination is needed to identify and act out alternatives. Prophets are always doing this, you know, prophetic acts, you know, some of them rather strange, just to show things can be different. And we saw something of this in the initial aftermath of Vatican II, in which all over the world, groups developed creative pastoral ministries and liturgies, reforming and forming alternative communities. So, for example, a direct result of the Council's appeal to a previously ignored and rather strange image of the Church as the pilgrim people of God, that, that term, which we're so familiar with after the, wasn't at all familiar in the history of theology. It emerged as the fathers of the council went back to the scriptures, back to the prophetic tradition, back to the model of Jesus' life. The pilgrim people of God, not stuck on a journey, having to adapt as needs must. Yet now we lament the decline of settled communities and growth of a once more increasingly ritualistic priesthood. I trained young priests for 25 years, and, you know, I, I don't know where we've gone wrong. <laughs> but not, they're, not lovely, they're lovely guys, they're all lovely guys. But, you know, when you see on a Sunday a young man with a Roman colour this big, a cassock with 33 buttons, a cummerbund, and what on earth is going on? And when he tells people off for not taking the host in their hand, or, you know, what on earth is going on? Um, we lament the decline of certain communities and the growth of once increasingly ritualistic priesthood. In prophetic imagination and ministry, critique of the present and of energising acts towards a promised and different future are held in tension. Because the God we are faithful to is not capable of being tied down, limited, or defined in any simple way. Prophetic imagination is born of the encounter of Moses with the voice from the burning bush in Exodus 3, which we've already mentioned. But what comes through is he encounters the free God, Yahweh, I am who I am, I will be who I will be, I will be where I will be. <laughs> Through this encounter and what follows, Moses is freed from the fixed religion he had experienced in Egypt. A completely structured state. From the Pharaoh, who was a divine figure, and his priests, down to the slaves. Everyone had their right place, <coughs> and this was governed by the gods. And all you had to do was repeat year after year what you'd done before to keep the gods happy. And so, of course, it was a religion that reinforced the way things were, the status quo. A fixed society of Pharaoh and Egypt. Instead, Moses is drawn into a different social reality, created by this free, strange Yahweh, utterly free. And the prophet spearheads a radical social and political reality in response to that call. Not easily, of course. A new political and social reality of a liberated people with a theological cause. The encounter with the free and living God who comes alongside the powerless in compassion and liberation. This is the structure of Egyptian society, basically, set out in its hierarchical order. The political claims of Pharaoh's empire are blown away by the revelation of the freedom of God. And Moses enables 
is enabled to begin an alternative politics, politics of justice and compassion, which will enable a new people to emerge, freed by the God of freedom. The Egyptian gods legitimated the ordered society, the order of Pharaoh, where those who have are protected at the expense of those who have not. But the plagues, the plagues, show up the weakness of the gods and of the priesthood of Egypt. Show up the lack of integrity, the lack of power underpinning the politics of oppression of the empire, which had now failed to control its nobodies. The myth of Pharaoh's power is revealed, and the social structures of his empire exposed in their weakness. The alternative, strange religion is based on the, not on the virtue of the people, is based on the divine freedom, dependent on no social reality, nor co-opted to any particular power structure. Yahweh acts from God's reality, for God's own purpose. The calling of the 12 slave gangs, migrant workers, victims of empire and oppression, is the manifestation of a new politics of justice and compassion, reflecting the revelation and vision of God's freedom. This lasted historically for about 250 years, not very long. Because what, you know, what happens, the kings, the people want a king like everyone else, and by the time you get to Solomon with his hundreds and hundreds of uh, wives and so on, for the, which he has for the stability of his nation and for making it allies with the local, you've lost all of this. And the power of the king is virtually back with Pharaoh. You know, we've got Pharaoh re, re, reliving. We are indeed made in the image of our own gods. This is a claim that John Milbank, who is a professor at Northampton, um, has shown in a very famous book, Theology and Social Theory, from a few years ago. I'm not a fan of his, in fact, <laughs> but on, in this particular case, he did a very interesting and, I think, valid piece of work. He shows how our sociology reflects our theology, the way we see society, even if it's an atheistic world, <coughs> how our sociology reflects a sort of idea of God. So Moses, the prophet, proposes a religion of God's freedom to the state religion of order and triumph and a politics of justice and compassion as an alternative to the imperial politics of oppression. <coughs> Moses' inspired prophetic acts lead to an assault on the consciousness of the empire, which was so fixed and the dismantling of its oppression, of its oppressive social practices and mythical underpinnings. <clears throat> Prophetic criticism starts from the capacity of a people to grieve. In the Exodus chapter two, we have this quote, the people of Israel groaned under their bondage and cried out for help. And their cry under bondage came up to God, and God heard their groaning. Grieving, the most visceral response to things not being right, is the beginning of prophetic imagination and criticism. The word in Hebrew, to cry out, has a double meaning. In Hebrew, it's za'ach. It's both a cry of misery, but it's also, it also means the filing of an official complaint. It's interesting, huh? There is an expectation that the wrong which has been cried out will be responded to and answered. This grieving, revealing all is not right, is the first moment in prophetic imagination 
and critical consciousness. This cry which begins history is acknowledged by God. I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. Moses and Aaron know that intercession to Yah, apologies if anyone in this room is from a Jewish background, I apologize for using the holy name so freely. If I was in a Jewish community, I would never do this, but I need to do it today because it's precisely the name that is so important, so liberating. Moses and Aaron know that intercession to Yahweh, the God of freedom, is at the heart of the identity of this new people, who were no people. Twelve migrant gangs, really. We call them tribes, that's a bit glorious. You know? But the prophetic imagination doesn't take so easily among the people. Those who are used to the stability of servitude, who are used to knowing their place. And so in Exodus 5, 8 and chapter 15, the Israelite supervisors still turn to Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt because they're not easy with this transition to freedom. It takes the cycle of plagues to show that how powerless the empire of Egypt, of Pharaoh, is and how static his gods are. They can't adapt to this situation. The people see the structures dismantled before their very eyes. The people find a different focus for their grief. Moses' prophetic imagination has begun to help them to move out of slavery to the risk of freedom, the freedom of the followers of the free God, Yahweh. The great uh, German prophetic poet, theologian Dorothea Söhle, in a, a lovely book she wrote in the 70s, called, just called Suffering, shows how the redirection of grief, addressing cries to where they can be answered, rather than to where they are ignored, is often the beginning of empowerment, so that a previous powerless people begin to make their own history. The return to charisms after Vatican II, the charisms of the original of the religious orders, you know, going back to their foundresses and founders, was such a liberating movement in the life of many congregations. I remember it because I was involved in helping them to think some of it through because a lot of it involved working with the scriptures. The scriptures play on the two cries that the people, that of the people and that of the Egyptians and Pharaoh, whose power is being dismantled around him. But too late. A new history had begun which is still being worked out today. A history that is not the keeping of everything as it was. Which is true of all the cultures of the ancient world. That's what they thought they had to do in sacrificing to the gods. Keep everything as it is. A history that is not the keeping of everything as it was. But the opening up to a free and promised future. Which is always part of the prophetic imagination. So part of the prophetic imagination seen in the Moses narrative. My taskmaster has told me I've got 10 minutes left. So. <clears throat> so part of the prophetic imagination seen in the Moses narrative is to energize alternative possibilities, to generate hope. The empire of Egypt believed everything was as it should be. It just had to be maintained with the minimal moving of pieces into new patterns which did not undermine what already was there. There was no expectation of the new. The prophet speaks against such manipulation and provokes us to imagine and step out towards a truly new future. Futures that are not simply derived from past practice. I put that lovely poem of Frost up because it's about making such a decision. 
to step us out on a road you have never gone down before and face the consequences. This, of course, is hugely challenging. Many prefer the known past to the as yet un unseen future. Stepping out into the prophetic imagination can provoke fear. It involves a certain darkness. Moses and Israel know more, know more about Yahweh's freedom than Egypt did. And they entrust themselves to it in fits and starts, one step forward, two steps back. But in the end, they know that the empire of Pharaoh cannot be trusted, even though it is known, and as it were, is in the light, in the daylight. They know it intimately. The people led by prophetic imagination find a new energy in trust and the encounter with the liberating Yahweh. Even if that encounter is sometimes in circumstances they cannot anticipate and that are in a sense dark, strange. <clears throat> Another aspect of the prophetic imagination that Moses shares is the extraordinary realization that God takes sides. His prophet Moses passionately lives this out. He himself was a member of the imperial court. He's a member of the elite. His situation was totally secure for the rest of his life. But he takes sides in the name of Yahweh with the losers, the powerless, the marginal. And eventually this will be translated into God is for us. God's freedom is expressed in God's choice of them. This is not how organised religion had been experienced, where the gods maintained the way things were. Now, sadly, Israel, and later the church, will forget this radical freedom of God at times, and assumes their structures, the kingdom, the temple, the Vatican, the Pope, the Episcopacy, are sustained by the free God. Very dangerous. When I was a young theologian, I was taught extra ecclesia non est salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. What utter arrogance. What mindless limiting of the nature of the divine. And yet we, we were taught it very seriously. And then talk clever ways to sort of get around it, to allow good people elsewhere who hadn't really had the gospel to present it to them to come in by a baptism of desire. Just. Now, this is a very dangerous presumption that God is on your side in that way for all your structures. And it, it has with it a whole court theology, which I was expected to sustain as a young theologian, you know, Bishop Scott. There's a document from Rome Against Liberation Theology. Write some nice talks about this, David. <coughs> I said no. <laughs> Look where I got myself. To <laughs> sustain it. And for me, I grew up in that core theology. To, and it's taken a lifetime to unlearn it. Because it's so all-encompassing. Eventually, the people get something of the sense of the awesome freedom of Yahweh. I mean, the charismatic renewal has been a help in, in the Catholic Church in a way of opening up that freedom of the Spirit again. It has its own issues. But... Eventually, the people get something of the sense of the awesome freedom of Yahweh and how they have been caught up into that creative freedom. And this is turned into song. Into song. Prophetic imagination always needs song and poetry and art and drama to find appropriate expression. So we have the liberating, liberating song of the sea in Exodus 15. We have Miriam's wonderful song in Exodus uh, 15, which focuses on the freedom of God to act and their freedom as derived from God's. And in those songs, the use of the, this holy name, this new name for God, re is repeated again and again. They're exploring its meaning and its implications. In praise and song, they name the name that redefines their social reality. 
and that celebrates an unforeseen turn in history. They celebrate in dance free bodies no longer under the control of Pharaoh. Miriam picks up a tambourine and the women follow her in ecstatic movement, celebrating the freedom the free God has created for them. How easily that freedom of the body has been curtailed, both in Judaism and Christianity over the ages, with control of the body being so often part of the oppression of religion. You might say, well, these are only songs. What difference does a song make to the real world? But the shift is to a new imagined reality. It depends in part on the words we find to express it. It was the gospel songs of the American slaves that kept alive their vision and hope. It was the presence, the protest songs of the 60s of Dylan and Byers that I grew up with, which at first opened me up to seeing the world differently. If I had a hammer, you know, and, and so on. You know. the, the culture wars we, five minutes now, thank you. The culture wars that we have, I think I do, we have witnessed recently in the church are all too often based on particular forms of speech, of rhetoric. Language legitimizing change or managing reality. Keep your things as they are. Structuring and scheduling and ensuring there is no change. Doxology, the language of praise, is always dangerous. It breaks out of control. And it is language which makes possible compassion and justice, transforming fear into energy. We celebrate, <clears throat> at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, the encounter of two extraordinary women. And we celebrate this in the office, those of us who say the office, when Mary meets Elizabeth, and the spirit of Miriam flames forth again. The child, John, dances in the womb, and the word used is the same word used of David dancing before the Ark of the Covenant, before the presence of the divine. And the two women pour forth the purest prophetic imagination of their people. The Magnificat is like a synthesis of the whole prophetic tradition. It's also a synthesis of the whole of the gospel. The men, <laughs> in this case, poor old Zachary, Elizabeth's husband, is silent. <laughs> the male voice is absolutely silent. It's so fascinating. Until he bends to the free God's will and names his son John, which wasn't a name in the family. The only voices heard until that moment are two free women who with extraordinary intensity express the prophetic imagination of their people and anticipate its renewal as God comes close again in sovereign freedom, starting from the oppressed because they are among the Anoim, the poor of Yahweh, working towards a new unforeseen community of freedom, the kingdom, which is still emerging. Um, I'll skip something I was going to say here. Just. Uh, St. Paul <coughs> um, speaks of this process as reconciliation in his letter to the Corinthians. And I just want to briefly mention this because he uses a very interesting word which we have translated as um, reconciliation. The word is katalage. Katalage. Um, if I just read from 2 Corinthians 5. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us, okay, to himself through Christ, and given us, you and me, the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespass against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Notice, reconciling the world. Not just the church, the world. This involves a radical solidarity of existence for others because this word, katalege, uh, it literally means towards the other. Alos is the other. So reconciliation is living towards the other, for the other, with the other, on behalf of the other. 
We can't save our souls without saving the soul and body of the other. I put a little picture in there of a lovely Jewish-French philosopher called Emmanuel Levinas, and he has taken up the idea of the other and explored it profoundly in his writings. He takes up, remember Buber, Martin Buber, who wrote I and Thou, and Buber argues, as long as we treat the other as a thou, as a real person, then there's so much hope for what happens. Once we begin to treat the other as an it, those wretched you know, people living off benefits, they're it's, they're no longer, then all sorts of things go wrong in our world. And what Levinas does is he takes that further and says each of us is radically, mysteriously othered. Even if you've been married 50 years, there is an element of depth in each one of us that is other, yeah? still to be plumbed, if that's true. Of course, what we're doing there is the image of God is reflecting the divine of us. Fascinating stuff. John Donne, as we all know, famous, realized this when he wrote 400 years ago, no man, excuse me, for him that was an inclusive term, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Not one of us is not affected by yours. Nearly there. <clears throat> Freedom is only possible in solidarity, in being free for others, in all their strangeness. But solidarity is only possible ultimately as the realization of and participation in our strange God's unconditional love for us all. In Christ, our strange God comes alongside us as the man for others. And if I had time, I would have opened up how Jesus' teaching is so different from the rabbis, because he keeps breaking the circle of those you include around, you know, all the time. In Christ, our strange God comes alongside us as the man for others, opening up the possibility of such solidarity and of the reconciliation the living for the stranger that it makes possible. May it be so. Thank you for listening to my stories.